This morning to uh, Seacoast Media Group. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm Howard Altschuler. I'm the executive editor here. And Seacoast Media Group publishes the Portsmouth Herald, Foster's Daily Democrat, Exeter Newsletter, Hampton Union, New York Weekly, New York County Co-Star, and the website's Seacoast Online, and uh, Foster's.com. And uh, I'm very uh, proud this morning to have uh, Hedrick Smith with us. And uh, I thank all of you guys for getting out here so, uh, so early. Um, I, I get the sense that you know all these people, or at least most. <laughs> <laughs> I feel as though, but maybe uh, in in the by by way of introductions, um, you know, because everybody deserves a good introduction. Um, this is a a, a two-time Pulitzer Prize winner um, for the uh, his role uh, with the New York Times uh, in the Pentagon Papers, and for dispatches from uh, Eastern Europe and uh, and Russia uh, when you were the uh, Moscow bureau chief. I was also interested to read in your biography that you uh, did on the ground reporting um, during the civil rights campaigns in the South. And uh, I'm rereading a uh, Martin Luther King biography right now. And um, we think things are rough now. I, 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 I'd be interested to know. Things, things were pretty rough then, too. And um, about five years ago, um, uh, Mr. Smith was here to talk Wait about this dude, Rick. Rick. <laughs> About five years ago, uh, Rick was here uh, talking about his book, Who Stole the American Dream? And in that, he kind of laid out how we reached this level of uh, income and uh, political power inequality. And uh, towards the end, and it was, it, was, it, was a little, it was a little depressing, I've got to say. And then towards the end, the um, last couple of chapters looked at things going on both in the United States and around the world. Um, where people were making a difference, where there were some good ideas about how to take the power back. And then you went on tour, and as you uh, were touring the country, you came across a whole bunch of other good ideas, and that's kind of what we're going to talk about today. So okay. without further ado, Thanks. Rick Smith. Thank you. I, I've uh, got a daughter in the audience. Um, Leslie, will you stand up, give him a wave. <laughs> So I have special reasons for coming to New Hampshire, but I love to come back here, and I've gotten to know a bunch of you personally. I won't mention you all by name, but several of you in the room, and the rest of you I feel as though I know, because uh, I've just been up here enough, and I feel as though I'm sort of part of your state, maybe an honorary citizen or resident. <laughs> um, I'm going to give you a better story, a more upbeat story today. Can you hear me all right? Do I need that? Am I okay? Um, I'm going to talk about what I call the missing story of American politics. And it's actually an upbeat story. It's a story about you and people like you all over the country. Uh, there is an upsurge of citizen activism in this country. And it is not just because of Donald Trump. He has accentuated things. Uh, but it's been building and it's really burst forth. Uh, what's going on around the country in states as different as South Dakota and North Carolina, as Florida and California, uh, as Utah and Michigan, there's an upsurge of activity of people who are saying, uh, the system is broken, the political system is broken, and we've been asking Washington to fix it, and we're fed up with waiting, and we've got to do it ourselves. Uh, this actually is, believe it or not, a very natural sequence to the last book that I wrote, Who Stole the American Dream. What I was concerned, as Howard said in that book, with not just the inequality of income, but with basically the stagnation of the American middle class, uh, being left behind uh, on the ash heap of history, not being taken care of and lifted uh, by a growing economy. The GDP figures look good. The growth of the economy look good. But the lifestyle and the income and the economic prospects and future of the middle class was stagnant. It wasn't going anywhere. And I went around the country, as Howard said, and I made a bunch of talks, and people did the natural thing, well, what do we do about it? And we started talking about measures that we could take to sort of fix things. And we kept running into political obstacles to getting them done. And that caused me to take more of a look at the political system that was going on. And it's led me to where I am today, talking about how you, you can't get to immigration, you can't get to worker training, you can't get to better education, you can't get to better roads, you can't get to really good infrastructure. It, no matter what issue you want to deal with, protecting the environment, worrying about climate change, whatever it is, in Washington anyway, 
that in a lot of states, you can't get there because of the political gridlock. We've got a system that's stacked in favor of incumbents. We've got way too much money having too much influence on our campaigns. Uh, we got battles over who can vote and whether or not people are qualified to vote and how easy it is to vote and getting people to actually participate. I became convinced that political reform is the gateway issue. It's the gateway to getting anything else done. And if we don't fix the political system, we're going to continue to be stuck on all these other issues that may be more important to us. And, you know, uh, political reform, political system is sort of a geeky issue, right? It's for nerds. It's, a, it's over there. It's a process thing. It's how our society works. It's how we pass budgets. It's, we're going to see it tonight in the State of the Union, whether or not they can avoid another shutdown. It's very fundamental to whether or not a whole um, democracy can work effectively. And I said this is going on around the country. Last year was a phenomenal year. Last year, five different states passed gerrymander reform. Why do you say gerrymandering? Why, why is that important? Well, it stacks the deck. Uh, Democrats are doing it in Massachusetts and Maryland and Illinois, and Republicans are doing it in Texas, and we're doing it in Florida and doing it in Ohio. And what happens is you don't have competitive districts. Uh, up until this last election, in the previous election, only about 10% of the districts of the House of Representatives, 40 out of 435, were competitive. So the public couldn't render a verdict on the behavior of Washington because the deck was stacked in favor of the people already sitting in office, uh, whether they were in a Democratic state or a Republican state. In order for democracy to work, the whole idea is competition. You've got to make districts, you've got to make elections competitive. So gerrymandering reform is terribly important. We can get into that if you want. You've got a couple of gerrymandering reform bills in your legislature this year. Uh, and you want to pay attention to them. We can talk about them later. But listen to the states. And th these were all pushed by citizen groups that said, this system stinks, it's broken, we have to do something about it. Michigan, Ohio, Missouri, Colorado, and Utah. Now those would not be your hit parades of reform states if you were to pick the, the ones you first wanted to name. And then Florida votes 69% to restore the voting rights of 1.4 million former felons who have served their time. Biggest change in voting population in America in a single move since the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And Maine adopts ranked choice voting. You may or may not want to do that, but it's an effort to try to say, we don't want to elect people to office without a majority vote. So we're going to give people a first choice and a second choice and a third choice until we get down to two people, until somebody gets a majority vote. And Connecticut joins the compact. This is last year. Connecticut votes <coughs> to join the compact of the states that are saying, we're tired of having the Electoral College pick the winner when the popular vote winner is somebody else. In previous American history had that happen once, the Hayes-Tilden race in 1876. We've had it happen twice in the last 20 years. People have said, we've got to do something about it. There were a dozen other states that did something about making voting easier. Uh, automatic voter registration, same-day registration uh, on the day you vote. Um, Pre-registering teens, 17-year-olds in high school, so that when they turn 18, they're there. You can get the young people engaged. All kinds of reforms are going on. Public funding of campaigns in Phoenix and Baltimore uh, and Portland, Oregon. Uh, disclosure laws being passed in New Mexico. New York just passed a bunch of things. So if this is in the air. It's moving. This is your moment. And what's really interesting to me to be here in New Hampshire, and I want to stop talking for a moment and let you actually see it, my thought was as a reporter, number one, the mainstream media is not covering the story I'm telling you. You're not seeing it. It hit, it's a blip here or there, but you don't get the picture that I'm putting together for you. So I thought, number one, i got to cover it because it's not being covered. And number two, if more people could see what other people are actually getting done, not wanting to get done, but getting done, more people would just say, hey, we could do it in our state. You can say a wonderful quote at the end of this, um, just watch for this at the end of this uh, program. We're going to show you this is just part of a documentary I've made. Um, we call it the people versus the politicians because this is about people power. The guy says, if we can do it in Florida, you can do it in your state. 
So have a look, and then we'll talk about it, okay? They said you couldn't win a ballot initiative unless you had at least $3 million. You don't see it in this uh, version, but they only had maximum 500000 They basically did it with volunteers, and they won the state, 63%. And if you're in a state like Washington or Utah or Ohio or Michigan, you do have the ballot initiative. You do have that process where the public can actually go and put an issue on the ballot and get it voted on. If you're in Connecticut or New Hampshire or some of the older states in the East, you can't do that. So look at the Connecticut example. They had a scandal. They're talking about public funding. The politicians basically don't want to move it. In, in Connecticut, it was basically the Democrats who had a better fundraising machine than the Republicans who were fighting public funding. But as the woman points out, Karen Hobart Flynn, it was public pressure. Remember the car washes for clean elections, the phone calls, the constant public pressure. And finally, the reporter tells us the public mood, the public shaming, he uses the word, the public shaming is so strong that the politicians decide they've got to move. So even if you're saying, well, it's in the legislature and we don't have the influence, you do. And you particularly do in a state like New Hampshire. Um, I don't know if they're, they're, they're representatives in this room. I'm sure they're former representatives in this room. Every time I come to New Hampshire, I go into any room, any coffee shop. I mean, somebody has been in the house for sure, right? So you, you people are really close. You can really have an impact. And this is a moment you don't want to miss. You have bills in the legislature this year, and I don't know them all, but you've got several bills to increase voting rights, voting access. You have at least three pieces of legislation on gerrymander reform. You have a couple of pieces on public funding, and you certainly have at least two pieces of legislation to repeal Citizens United and put New Hampshire on record is the 20th state that says, hey, let's go back to a system where somebody can regulate money in campaigns. So this is a moment, this is a pregnant moment. This legislature is a pregnant legislature for you all. Uh, I hope you're able to achieve something. And, and, and feel part of this movement that is going on around the country. And you don't know about it because uh, we in the media aren't telling you enough about it, but it's going on literally this year Already, there are 16 states that have voting rights measures, including, you won't believe it, Texas and Mississippi. Now, whether or not they pass in those states is another question, but the point is people are ginned up enough to say, we got to fix it. Kentucky, Iowa, states you just wouldn't imagine, things are going on. Anyway, so what are your reactions, what are your questions, what are your thoughts, where do you want to go? This is really important. This is New Hampshire. Come on, man. <laughs> Go ahead. Where is this being shown? Oh. And where can you get it to share it? All right. You can see, actually, an expanded version. This is a shorter version, and it's only part of the film. You can see it now on YouTube. YouTube. Go to YouTube. Go to People versus VS. People versus the politicians. You will find 30 videos up there. You'll find individual segments. You'll find one called uh, Winning Back Our Democracy, which is 50 minutes long. This is part of a 45-minute version. That's a slightly longer version, okay? So the whole thing is there for you to see. Plus, there are lots of other specialized videos um, on public funding in Montgomery County, um, Maryland, which has a population almost as large as New Hampshire, the whole state, right? Um, and you'll see stuff about gerrymander reform in Ohio and Michigan. There, there are a bunch of other things that I've put together that are three or four minutes long. Short little pieces, but there's lots of stuff there. Please pass the word around. Um, it's supposed to be broadcast on M MSNBC. Um, and I, I don't know how to explain it to myself, let alone to you, but the media is so uh, addicted to news about Trump, pro or con, and that could be Kavanaugh, that could be Khashoggi, I mean, I'm not just talking literally about the president, but issues that swirl around the president, that they, they actually bought the rights to, to broadcast our video, and it's been sitting there for six months, and when I, I've gone back to the woman who, who bought the video for MSNBC, and she says, yours is not the only one. We've got three or four good documentaries, and I can't get them on the air because they kept getting knocked off by Spot News. 
Um, I think, well, I just I gave you the best explanation I can. I'm getting fed up, and I want to take it back and take it to somebody else, see if I can't get it on some other broadcast. But they put significant money into it, so <laughs> I have to wait. YouTube, people versus what? YouTube, the people versus the politicians, VS. Don't write the word versus out. If you go to if you go to YouTube and you put that in, you'll go right there. And you'll see a whole I mean you'll see a slew of stuff. I don't know if you're familiar with YouTube, they have playlists, okay, by topic. We have them gerrymander reform, voting rights, dark money, uh, Citizens United. I mean you go right down, you can see uh, several different videos. And then there's one called Winning back our democracy, and that's the expanded version of this. Okay, mm -hmm. Howard, let them know. <laughs> Put it. Yes. You didn't mention term limits. Do you think the remedy is voting the politicians out of office instead of putting term limits on the on their I term, term limits? To me, as a reporter watching how politics works, term limits is attractive because uh, it sounds like you're going to do something. But in gerrymandered districts, you get the same politician with a different name. The problem is if, if the district, you want competition in elections so there can be a fight over ideas, over policies. If you have a gerrymandered district, you don't get that. In the first place, the turnout is extremely low in party primaries. I don't know if you know it, but Ted Cruz, when he first got nominated as a, a senator, Republican candidate for Senate uh, in Texas, uh, got nominated with 2% of the vote, 600,000 votes out of 27 million people because the turnout was so low. Um, so, you, I mean, if you're going to use term limits, then you're going to have to do something else with getting the turnout of the vote. You're going to have to do gerrymander reform in order to make the districts competitive. What happened in Florida is, is that you now have six districts that are much, we have, you have 15 districts or 20 districts that are more competitive, but in five or six, the incumbents got turned out, not by term limits, but by people actually having a chance to vote them out. In Pennsylvania, the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania ruled that there was a gerrymander in, in uh, 2011. Which, and the vote in Pennsylvania is like Ohio, it's like North Carolina, it's like Florida, it's, it's very close to 50-50. It's 52, 48, 51, 49, whatever. Every election for governor, for Senate, uh, U.S. Senate, and then the presidential election. Very close. And the same thing happened in the statewide congressional vote in Pennsylvania. Um, in fact, in, in a couple of years, the Democrats actually, Democratic candidates got more than Republicans. Republicans gerrymandered the district, so they got 13 House seats to five for the Democrats. Instead, the su Supreme Court redrew the maps, came out nine to nine. And so it, it's, a much, it's a much more effective way to change. It isn't just changing the person, it's changing the dynamics of the election that matters. And it's also re-engaging voters. Because what goes on is if you basically get the same kind of candidate, people say, well, there's no point in voting. If you're up, particularly if you're in the minority party, but even if you're in the majority party. And so what you wind up is, I, I mentioned Texas with 2% uh, turnout, but there are lots of party primaries around the country where the turnout is 4 to 10%. Uh, so you're not getting representative results in the back. Montana is interesting. Montana is, is a pro-reform state. Montana was one of the first states that voted a uh, popular vote in favor of rejecting Citizens United. In 2012, Montana and, and Colorado, 74%. It was very striking. Uh, in Colorado, and I think it's also true in Montana, every single county in the state voted overwhelmingly. So red counties, blue counties. But what I find is interesting is if you go to Washington and you talk about political reform, there's a clear partisan divide. Mitch McConnell, Mitch McConnell has been one of the most persistent foes of, of uh, political campaign finance reform in the Senate. He opposed, he fought McCain-Feingold. He fought John McCain in 2002. And he's been going ever since. And he's got the Republican Senate working basically that way. Not everybody's with him, but, but pretty much. In some state legislatures, you find the same thing, but it's not quite as clear. There are some Republicans who are for it, and some Democrats who are against it. But when I get to the grassroots, I find it's across the board. People say, this system is broken. We've got to do something about it. And Montana is a very good example of this. Do you see dark money on PBS? Yes. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. 
Very good show. Yes, ma'am. So, um, in Who's Told the American Dream, you noticed the pivot point when basically lobbyist money came in right. and changed things. Um, I've always told my friends in politics, you know, this was very strategic. Can you point to a place where the gerrymandering, someone was really smart, make it a plan? Yes, absolutely. So, can yeah. you point to that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And actually, now I'm going to give you another site. If you go to my website, it's called reclaimtheamericandream.org. Reclaim the American Dream, all one word, no capitals, no nothing, just reclaimtheamericandream.org. And you go to, the, and every issue has three subjects. It has an issue briefing, a progress report which tells you what's going on all around the country, and a success story. Under the issue brief for gerrymandering, you'll see the story of Red Map. We have had gerrymandering since Eldridge Geary, not Jerry, in 1812 in Massachusetts. It was the Democrats in Massachusetts that started the gerrymandering, okay? It's been done state by state. The first time we ever had a national gerrymandering strategy was in 2010. And it was organized by Karl Rove and a bunch of extremely smart, mm -hmm. very clever Republican operatives who had were very disappointed at losing the presidential election in 2008 to Obama. And they said, the place we can protect our power politically is going to be the House of Representatives. Now listen to this. There are about 6,000 legislative districts in the country. What they did was they figured out that there were 116 of them which were in states where the balance of the state legislature was within one or two seats. And if they could flip those 116 seats, they could flip 12 legislative chambers they did better than that. They flipped 17 legislative chambers in the election of 2010. Why is that important? Because in 2011, those legislatures were drawing the maps for the gerrymandering of 2011. And the Republicans nationwide totally dominated that. I mean, it was an extremely smart political strategy. It was very, very clever politics. And they spent a lot less money going after those state elections than if they tried to win the congressional seats one by one. It was, it was brilliant. And, it, and the Democrats took at least two or three years to actually wake up to what was going on. And what's amazing is Rove wrote an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal during the 2010 campaign, and he said this election is going to be decided down ballot, which means not at the congressional level, but at the legislative level. Democrats didn't even know us, and even told them which some of the states and some of the districts. It, it's, it's amazing. Now what's happened is that Democrats have awakened to that. I get asked by people about um, uh, President Obama and his former Attorney General, uh, Eric Holder, uh, mounting a counter strategy. In my opinion, I'm a reporter, uh, so I'm nonpartisan here, but in my opinion, it's foolish for a party to oppose gerrymandering. You can't win that way. It has to come from an across-the-board coalition. You have to have Republicans and Democrats and Independents involved to get the reform. Uh, and if it becomes partisan, then it's just, uh, well, we're going to run it our way as opposed to they're running it their way. And what we need is voters. We need, we need a level playing field. Well, ranked choice voting actually did that, I think, in Maine. So. Yeah, no, that's another way of doing it. But the point is, <clears throat> the point is not to switch seats. The point is to give voters the power to make the decision. Yes. Um, so going along what you just stated, what is the hope, though, for that actually happening? When you say, when you're saying that in order for this to happen, it has to be bipartisan, but but everyone knows that the changing of America in terms of the fact that we're becoming more diverse and there are more people of color who are start are are going the demographics are going to change. The Republican Party and the Conservatives know that. So, so there, what hope would there ever be for those people who have traditionally been in power? They see the, the writing on the wall coming. So I don't see, I don't know how you would engage the conservatives and the Republicans well, to believe in this because they're, they're going to they're, they're gonna lose. I mean, they yeah. have, the only way they can win in the future is by cheating like this. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I don't know whether or not that's true, but there are more and more people who are recognizing what you're saying. Include, uh, I mean, there's a New York Times Magazine article about Mitch McConnell, uh, not this past Sunday, but the previous Sunday, 
and on this particular issue, it's a very good article about him in general, but on this particular issue, um, uh, the reporter is asking McConnell about the president and the, the president's alienating women and alienating minorities. <coughs> And uh, McConnell says to him without saying Trump's wrong, he just says, well, no party can continue to be competitive if it loses minorities and women in suburban districts over time. He's commenting on the results of the 20. So I mean, Mitch McConnell, who is a staunch foe of political reform, recognizes the bell is tolling. If that, I mean, now, he's not going to come out and attack the president because that's not his, the way he plays the game. But I'm telling you, people like Mitch, get it. And when they get to a point where they can't resist any more effectively, they'll flip. But it'll all happen suddenly. And, it, and it's, what's happening is it's happening in the states one by one, and you don't see it because it's happening in Utah. When I, did, when I gave you five states, I mentioned Utah. Okay? Totally dominated by Republicans. And they decide, citizens there decide we've got to have We've got to have gerrymander reform because Salt Lake City has been gerrymandered so it doesn't have a seat. Right? They've got three seats in Congress and they've split up Salt Lake City in so many different little pieces and connected it to the rural Republican parts of the state so that the largely Democratic city of Salt Lake City doesn't have a seat. People finally woke up and it got changed there. It, I mean, what's amazing is as people awaken to the potential of people power, politicians have to adjust to that. There's a, a great comment made to me by a, 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 an organizer in the Southwest, a guy named Ernie Cortez. Um, and he said to me once when I was talking about, about why things weren't happening, I was actually talking to him about an issue that you've raised by implication, which is why aren't Hispanics, Latinos in Texas and the Southwest voting in larger percentages? And he said, part of our problem is the feeling of powerlessness. He said, Rick, absolute power corrupts. Power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. He said, powerless, powerlessness also corrupts. If people feel powerless, they in fact are. We have to, we have to give ourselves the power to make the change and then we'll start to make the change. And that's happening. What's happening in Texas, I was just down in Texas last month, and what's amazing is, you know, the big cities in Texas, Houston, Dallas, San Antonio, and Austin, the cities have been blue for quite a while, okay? So they're heavily minority. Now what's happening is the blue is spreading out into the suburbs, and in Harris County, which is the area surrounding Houston, 4.2 million people, six congressional seats, two held by Republicans thanks to gerrymandering and the other four by Democrats. <coughs> Harris County was swept in this last election in 2018 for the first time by Democrats. Every single, every single local office, every mayor, they don't call them mayors down there, they call them judges uh, in jurisdictions, every single one, 18 of them, went Democratic. And the same thing has happened in Dallas County. The demographics you're talking about are starting to catch up. And as they catch up, politicians will either go out of office or, like businesses, they'll change their business plan. Or they'll dig in their heels. Well, and they, are, they, no, they are no, I they mean, not will dig in their heels. They're digging in their heels now. But um, as they see it fail, they adjust. I mean, that, that's, that's part of what's going on. And you do have, I mean, you do have some representatives down in Texas who are Republican uh, who are actually. It used to be that only only Northerners were moderate Republicans, like Saltonstall and Maggie J. Smith and people like that. You now have we have now some moderate Republicans from the South because they're recognizing what you're talking about. But it's just starting to happen. I'm giving you leading indicators of, of what's what's going on. Yeah, Joan. Thank you for, for being with us. You're stressing uh, citizen participation and you're stressing the state level. And Right. We have a lot going on here. What about in the Congress, the first bill introduced mm -hmm. right. by the House, right. which is now Democratic majority, is right. H.R. 1, that is dealing with the voter purging, it's right. dealing with the restoring uh, uh, BRA, it's dealing with anti-gerrymandering. <laughs> what about that? How does that interact with your... Well, I think that I think that's become possible in part. Well, obviously, it's become possible because of the Democratic victory 
a majority in, in the EU, in the EU. House races in this last election. But I think it's also become possible because it's bubbling up from below. Uh, you don't just have people like John Sarbanes, who's the representative from Maryland, who's put together this HR1 package you just described, but you have now people getting elected, and there are, by the way, apropos of your question, there are now, I don't know, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14 Republicans who are interested in this because they're newly elected and they've come from this different political environment we're living in, okay? So um, it's very important because it, it will mean probably within the next month there will be a major political system reform bill passed by one house. Guess how, guess how Mitch is going to receive that in the Senate? <laughs> it's not going to get to the floor. Okay. So, so then the question is why do it? Because you know, I mean, Sarbanes and Nancy Pelosi and company, they're smart enough to know Mitch is not going to let it come to the fore. Part of it is they want to put down a brand for the Democratic Party. We stand for reform as a party, okay? Part of it is they want to make it an issue so that when people come up here to campaign uh, among you all for the presidential nomination, they have to answer questions about what do you think about H.R. 1 and that package, okay? So it's a longer term uh, strategy to try to put it on the agenda for, for 2020. Um, I think the much more important question is, are they politically canny enough to split up pieces of this and not just pass a large package, but offer ways for Republicans who are inclined to go, particularly for funding disclosure. That's something Republicans t tend to go for more than, say, gerrymander reform or public funding. But gerrymander reform is now coming around. There are some that are for that. And there are some Republican conservative organizations that are very much pushing for um, particularly no foreign funding. What does no foreign funding mean? It sounds obvious. No Chinese, no Russian. But what about those American companies that decided that they wanted to avoid American taxes by turning themselves into an Irish company. They Remember, they merged with an Irish company and suddenly the Irish company owned the much larger American company, so they paid taxes in Ireland and not here. Are they now foreigners? Answer, could you pass legislation that said those American subsidiaries of the now foreign corporation cannot contribute to campaigns? Okay, that doesn't get rid of Citizens United. That doesn't put a lid on but it starts getting a bunch of players out of the game that have got a lot of money. Now that is something you could probably get Republican co-sponsors on and get large uh, numbers of, of people to sign on. There's a, a Republican or a very conservative group uh, called Take Back the Republic, run by a guy named John Pudner. He's the guy who ran Dave Bratt's campaign that beat Eric Cantor. So he comes from the way right. He is very much in favor of campaign finance reform. He's working on it. Okay, this is another one of the indicators. The stuff is starting to happen. You don't see it. It hasn't gotten large enough yet. But so if I were if I were there and saying I want to get long term, I want to get some passed, I would f chip off pieces of that and say where can I get myself a majority, and then go to the don't go to Mitch, but go to somebody else, Susan Collins, go, go to somebody, Lisa Murkowski, Rob Porter, go to somebody in the Senate and say how about sponsoring a bill like the one we've passed, and taking over a chunk of it. Because we're never going to get there uh, on a single party thing. I, I don't believe it. John. Uh, Henry uh, and Jones, uh, I was with Chris Pappas, our wonderful little, excuse me, my bias. Uh, <laughs> John, and, uh, speak a little louder. Uh, I was with Chris Pappas over the weekend, our wonderful new Democratic congressman. And Chris is uh, co sponsoring Sarbanes' bill. But Henry, he advised that they're going to do exactly what you suggest. They are going to split it up. They are working on how to split it up now so that they can do just what you point out. Start to bring more Republicans in on particular issues, like you mentioned, where there might be some Republican support. So that, according to Chris, why? Yeah, I've heard the same thing. I just want to see how it's framed and whether or not it's really got good chances. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yes, ma'am. Um, I have to say, I, I wish I could. Uh, the question was, can I say any more about ranked choice voting and where that's going? Um, I don't know for sure, but I've talked to some people in Massachusetts this year who say they may want to make that their big push. 
Uh, I've talked to people with Common Cause in, in, in Massachusetts and a couple of other, represent us, a couple of other organizations that are in Massachusetts. And because of the main vote, they're thinking about trying that in Massachusetts. They haven't gotten to the point of making a decision yet. It's early in the cycle, so they may wait a while on that. Uh, you know, there, there, are going to be, there are going to be other states, but there are probably going to be other counties and cities that are going to be doing it. There are there, I'm sorry I can't remember them, but there are one or two other cities around the country that have ranked choice voting now. And, and what's going on in a lot of states, uh, be, partly because of the red map was the name of the strategy I was talking about before, the Republican strategy to, to capture the gerrymandering nationwide. Because of that, because uh, so many state legislatures are in the hands of the Republican Party, Democrats and independents have focused on cities. So you're starting to see Seattle, Phoenix, Portland, Denver, Baltimore, you're starting to see cities do things. So my hunch is you're going to see ranked choice voting uh, used in city elections and, and then from there spread to the states. But I, it, I can't tell you at this point uh, that it is actually happening in this cycle. The only place I've heard that it, they're going to work on it, it, it or may work on it, is, is Massachusetts. Yes, sir. What about uh, changing the uh, uh, whole uh, uh, project about uh, uh, the amount of uh, represent, uh, people uh, to have a representative? You mean how many people have a yeah, No, I know how many they have now, but what about uh, making uh, a modification? Uh, then, then you would have to uh, re, uh, uh, reestablish uh, uh, a uh, uh, a fairer uh, uh, system uh, uh, countrywide. Um, I don't. Are you simply saying that if you enlarge the house? Yeah, you, right now, right now, what do we got? Uh, 2,500 uh, in New Hampshire, or whatever it is, uh, uh, 5,000. Uh, reduce it to uh, another number. Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, but if the job is still in the hands of the same people that draw the maps, they will. Well, they will yeah, but 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 it would be uh, uh, transparent. Uh, it's transparent now. Well, I understand, <laughs> but uh, the, the I mean it's transparent. The, well, it's not, I mean, your 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 thesis has been that it's not transparent that you've got uh, people uh, uh, manipulating, uh, and then once uh, the. Uh, Manipulation uh, is uh, uh, is forthcoming, uh, then it's transparent. But I'm talking about the the basic system and and just uh, uh, reduce uh, the amount of uh, representatives that we have in Congress. Uh, I, I so you'd have to start you'd have to start all over again. I don't see that having any of impact on the states at all. I don't I don't think that would have any impact at all because. What, what are politicians most interested in? You got it. getting elected and getting reelected. Okay, so all they're doing is they're stacking the the deck. They're draw, they're writing the rules. They're saying, actually, we don't want right field to be at 90 degrees. I can't hit there. Uh, I'd really like it to be back over here in the stands. I, reduce foul territory, and my batting average would go up. Right? That's what they're doing. They're changing the rules in order to make it easier to, to get a hit or a home run. Understand. Right? Okay. So, but if they're the ones who are making the rules, yeah, but whether you have whether you have 120 people on the field or 500 people on the field, they're still going to make the well, same it'd rules. it would be a lot easier to manage uh, 25 people than uh, 175. All right. Good luck. <laughs> now, by me, I mean try. If you if you think anybody's going to reduce the size of the House of Representatives, yeah, well, you got, you got another. Oh, well, <laughs> you're yeah. a more ambitious guy than I am. <laughs> Let me try that one. On the commissions that redistrict these areas and try to determine uh, eliminate gerrymandering, what is the composition of these commissions so that they are apolitical? Go to the front of the class. <laughs> The, re the genius of the Florida reform is it doesn't rely on the membership of a commission. It says point bank by law you may not draw district lines with the intent to favor one party over the other. That is a ju judiciable issue. You can take that to court. And if you prove it, you do what the Florida Supreme Court did, you throw it out. 
So, some states, which like the idea of taking the job out of the hands of the legislature, turn it over to a, a Colorado just voted, a tripartite commission. Four Republicans, four Democrats, and I think in Colorado it's four independents. In Michigan it's five, which is interesting, which gives the independents an edge, okay? And they do the job. Some states count on that. <coughs> the membership of the commission being a step away or two steps away from the legislature doing it. Other states say, not enough. California's got a very cumbersome procedure, but it's designed to take the politics out of the choice of those people. They have to go through a vetting, which would be similar to the vetting for a court appointment in California by an independent state panel. Other states have said, okay, we want the independent commission, but we're gonna take the Florida standard I'm going to put it in the rules and say the commission has got to operate with a nonpartisan basis. They can't look at past voting records, but the way you gerrymander is you, people are pretty reliable in the way they vote most of the time. And if you go back and study the last four or five statewide elections, you can pretty well tell how people in this block and this precinct and this place are going to vote. Well, what they do is they forbid the people who do the redistricting to look at any past electoral results. And then they put in a standard, you can't do it to tilt it to favor one party or in favor of incumbents. So it's not just the independent commission. And I'm not commenting on your legislation without commenting on your legislation. <laughs> your legislation doesn't actually go far enough. It doesn't put in it what I'm saying. You need that standard in there that says you can't stack it to tilt it for one party or the other. Because if you, otherwise, it's then the people who get appointed. Well, the people who are going to get appointed are going to get appointed by the speaker and the minority leader. And the president of the Senate, the minority leader. So it's the politicians picking their friends so you've taken it one step away, but maybe you haven't taken it far enough. It's better, but is, is it good enough? That's up to you all. But the Florida standard is one hell of a good standard. If you get that in there somewhere where just this point blank, we don't want an election with stacked districts for one party or the other. That's a pretty clear standard. I mean, historically what the Constitution and other um, laws have said is you have to have equal population. Do you know one point? We didn't even have districts with equal population. We used to have districts in Congress where there were a million in some districts and there were 200,000 in others. So it, it took a court decision, Supreme Court decision back in the 1960s that said they've all got to have roughly, now it's 700,000, but whatever it is, it's got to be, okay? So that got set. Then it, it says contiguous. they got to be contiguous. Well, you saw that district of Florida. It's contiguous, right? All those lines. Actually, at one point, there's a, there's a line running down a railroad from, for, about, for about three miles. You know, so it's contiguous. But it's a joke. You look at it. And it's supposed to be compact. Well, obviously, it's not compact. So there are those standards, but there really needs to, if, if we're trying to correct for politics, then we need a nonpartisan political standard put in to the ground rules. And we get right field and left field with the lines out here. Yes. <laughs> That's a foul ball, this is a fair ball, that kind of thing. Yeah. Somebody had an asked a question. There are three high schools in the country right now that are in um, independent right. uh, um, to select the districts. And now I'll look at them again with that point of view. I don't, think, I don't think that language is there. I'm not sure. But everything yeah. I've heard so far well, tells me I'm that language isn't there. So if you have a telephone, you can suggest it to someone. Yeah, but then that's a good point because um, I just got an email from one of our legislators this morning because I've been trying to learn how a bill goes through right. in New Hampshire, in Concord. And I'm 62 years old, and this is the first time I've ever even thought about this, but I, <laughs> and I want everyone to do it because it's so rewarding. Um, and contact our uh, representatives. They need to hear from us. So the email I got this morning said, thank you for writing to me about this issue. It was just an email that I sent him. And he said, it's such a breath of fresh air after only hearing from lobbyists. And I just, I just want to impart that to everyone. That oh, that's great. Read that you can go to, um, is it Citizens Count? There are many yeah, the websites, the, the General Court. 
And then you, you can read the text of the bill, you can um, learn what committee is hearing it and contact those people because they need to hear from us. That, and it's so easy. Uh, I, I mean, it takes a little while. I had a couple of misspellings in some of mine that I have really regretted, but you know, I'm going to keep moving forward and I hope that you all join me in doing it. That's terrific. It's really, really important. And, and literally, it makes a difference. It does. I mean, just what you said. I mean, people will say, "My God, I heard from a real voter." Yeah. I mean, I, I, it's interesting, but I've actually heard that from legislators in various different states. Somebody who hasn't asked that question yet. Among the different representatives you cited this morning, um, is there anywhere out there sort of compendium of sort of best practices or whatnot? I know I've been studying the state bills, and there's a Association of State Legislators has an yes. educational thing out in Rhode Island to spread on the subject. It's like five or six hundred bucks to go to it. But um, well, there is a there is a um, there's a website of the uh, I think it's called the Association of State Legislatures. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's not in Rhode Island. It's in, it's in Denver, but they have a they have a huge web page. Um, without trying to pump things, if you go to reclaimtheamericandream.org, which I gave you earlier, which is my website. Every single one of these reforms has what I call a success story. It doesn't mean it's the only way to go, but it is a good model. Uh, the, uh, I haven't updated it with some of the ones that happened in 2018. I've been busy with the film. Um, but but there, you've got some models there on every single issue. And if you look at the progress report, and there's a progress report nationwide on every one of these issues, you can then jump around and look at what different states are doing, it's very uh, and you can see. It. It, it, I mean, it, there's a lot of there's a lot of information on there. I mean, I update it all the time. I can't keep up. I'm one person. I have a hard time keeping up with the whole country on all these issues. But, but there's a lot of information there. There's a new site. There's some new people that are going to raise millions of dollars and try to do what I'm doing with a team of ten people, and they want to know if they can get my information to start with. So I'm talking about that. Maybe I'll turn it over to get, get more people doing it. It's a, it's a tremendous amount of work. But, they, but you can see a lot there. Um, there are the Brennan Law Center at New York University Law School is an excellent uh, site on the whole issue of political reform. Uh, very good um, and, and not heavy academics. I mean, thoughtful but not heavy academic stuff. So it's easy reading and it's very intelligent. Um, they're more analytical, they don't tend to do quite as broad reporting, uh, they don't keep up with everything, but every issue is well covered there. That's an excellent place to go. Uh, there's another place called the Campaign Legal Center, it's in Washington, uh, and they do some of the stuff that Brennan does. Uh, they're particularly interested in lawsuits. They're not so much interested in citizen action, which I'm interested in as well as lawsuits, but they're very good on them. So those would be places you could go. And then almost every issue has an organization that's taken interest in it. For example, on gerrymandering, there's an organization called Fair Districts USA. And so if you want to follow gerrymandering, they'll do that. Uh, and then there'd be organizations on Citizens United, uh, and there'd be organizations following um, you know, voter issues and that kind of stuff. But if you're looking for places that go across the board, I've given you three or four. Rick, just to keep you on schedule, we'll probably do one more question. Sure. And, uh... Yes, ma'am. I think this has uh, been a, a wonderful talk and is spot on in terms of, yes, it has to come from the people. Obviously, it's not coming the other group. But um, my question um, has to do with the two problems that are the most crucial right now, and they both in involve time and we don't have time. And one is uh, climate catastrophe, and the other is nuclear, uh, the, the problem with nuclear weaponry, right. which is, you know, is, they're both imminent. And so, as I've thought about these, the only means that um, I've thought there were out there had to do with direct action, which has been a technique that's been used for various movements and move those movements along, women's movements, and so on and so forth. Do you have any insights into that in, within the context I'm, of I'm going to disappoint you. I'm going to disappoint you because I'm going to come back and say, if you want to get that addressed, you better fix the political system. I well, mean, that's, if you, that's your biggest issue, okay? And I, I'm with you, okay? Yeah. 
You can't get there with the current Congress. You can't change the current Congress with term limits. You can only change it if you can affect gerrymander reform, public funding of campaigns, limiting campaign financing, and voters' rights. You can't get there. I started there. My issue was not climate change. My issue was economic inequality. But, I mean, and that's a huge issue we have to deal with, and jobs for people at a decent living standard for our kids and our grandchildren, okay? And climate change is certainly there. Um, I had a discussion with, uh, with the head of uh, investigative reporting for ABC News in Washington about 10 days ago. He has, he has 100 people working for him. 75, 75 of them are covering Trump. Why? Because it's the biggest story of our time. Okay? And I said to him, maybe you're missing the biggest story of our time, which is climate change. He said, yeah, but that's not what people want to hear about. I said, I said but that may be, if you're talking about your responsibility as a journalist, maybe you're missing that story. I know for 25 years, I missed the story of growing economic inequality, which was a far bigger story over a period of time than 80% of the stories that we were putting in the paper or putting on the air. I don't think you're going to reorient the media and you're not going to reorient the political system until you make the political system responsive to the will of the people. Yeah. I think you're probably right that if you got people to sit down and say what's the most important thing we can address in the next five years, you'd probably get more answers for climate change than you would for any other issue. If you're in Texas or Southwest, you'd probably get it out of immigration, and it would differ, but you'd certainly get But will the Congress move? Will the policymakers move? And what I'm, I'm saying is, really got to fix the system so we can talk to the system and tell them what we want if you're, them to do. If you're, if you're going to address the problem politically, that's true. And, and that's where you bump up against the, the, the terrible problem of time. We don't have a long yeah, time. Yeah, and there's no question about it. I, I couldn't agree with you more. I, but I'll walk with you. I, let's ride two horses at this. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm not trying to be stubborn. I just, uh, I, I, you know, I spent a number, a lot of years in Russia as a correspondent there, and I couldn't um, penetrate that system. But what I had to do was to try to understand how it worked as best I could, so I could explain it to other people. So when people said to me, "Why do the Russians behave the way they do? Why is Putin the way he is? What do we do about Putin?" You really have to understand them. So what I'm trying to do is to use the same lens on our own political system as if I was a foreign correspondent in America, not an American citizen. And what is working here, what's not working here, why is it working here, why isn't it working here? And it's that kind of intelligence that I'm trying to bring to you. And that's what brings me here. Uh, I don't have a political axe to grind. If I, we could solve a number of these problems with the current political system, I'd say, bang, let's go. But I'm, I'm, I, don't think, I don't think the evidence is there that we can do it. Wh what fun to have a conversation with you all this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Olivia Zink from uh, Open Democracy is in the back. And if anybody wants the just out in paperback, uh, Who Stole the American Dream, you can uh, meet with Olivia back there. And uh, I'll autograph had to autograph it, so it's an extra bonus, and then um, in about 10 minutes we'll meet with the editorial board. Okay, great. Great, thank you. <laughs> thank you.